For the first time in history, the World Trade Organization will have its first woman and African as its leader. Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, a Nigerian economist and former finance minister, will start her new role as the Director General at the Global Trade Body on March the 1st. In her inaugural statement, she says she would make global economic recovery from the pandemic a priority. She also vowed to restore and rebrand the World Trade Organization as a key pillar of global economic governance, a force for a strong, transparent and fair multilateral trading system. How significant is this changing of guard at this critical moment and uh, what can she bring to the role? I'm pleased to be joined via Zoom from Geneva by Professor Lucien Kuhn, Emeritus Professor at the University of International Business and Economics, and via Zoom from Busan, the Republic of Korea, by Professor Robert Kelly from the Department of Political Science at Busan National University. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So in her inaugural press conference on February the 15th, Dr. Okonyo Iwela said the WTO members are making history by appointing her as the first female and first African DG in the organization's 73-year history. Professor Liu, how do you look at the significance of her selection at this prominent post at this particular moment? Uh, thank you, Liu Xing. Uh, if we take the WQ as a vote, uh, I mean, since uh, uh, June or May last year, we, this board doesn't uh, have a, a captain. And now with uh, Dr. Ngozi being nominated, we do have a captain, and which happens to be, a, a, as you said, a female and African, which is good. It uh, explains the strength of the WTO with uh, its diversity. Uh, on the other hand, we also need to uh, remind ourselves that WTO is a very much a member-driven organization. So as Dr. Ngozi said in her statement, the direct general leaves behind working with the secure to help members achieve results. So, so members are the ones who make decisions and benefit from those decisions. So I think that's the way that probably the DG needs to find a way to work with the members in the future to mm. deliver her tasks. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Kelly, now Dr. On, uh, Okonyo Iwela served twice as Nigeria's finance minister and briefly as foreign minister. She also spent 25 years at the World Bank as a development econ economist and working on economic uh, development programs and policy reforms. Um, so how will her economic background and background with international development programs shape her role as uh, the WTO DG? Yeah, I think it's probably pretty important. I mean, the WTO is often criticized, particularly by non-governmental organizations and aid groups for being uh, sort of insouciant in the face of the impacts of trade on development. Um, this is particularly common, this critique is particularly common in uh, developing countries and it was sort of, you know, 20 years ago before 9-11 and everything, you know, you had sort of like big sort of pitched fights with NGO groups at the, you know, the WTO, the Battle of Seattle and things like that, right? So there's a whole constituency out there of people sort of, you know, sort of primarily on the political left who would like to see the WTO sort of bring social and developmental concerns, environmental concerns into trade negotiations. And so I think there will probably be some expectation that an African leader to the organization will do that. That said, if you actually look at her background, having worked for the World Bank and, you know, a lot of time in development and finance and stuff like that, my guess is she's probably actually fairly close to the traditional sort of neoliberal sort of thinking about trade that sort of dominated the way we thought about these issues for a long time. And I think the Washington consensus has fragmented on this stuff a little bit. It's not quite Davos world like it was 20 years ago, but I would be surprised if she comes out and actually says anything really dramatic about trade, how it's to be done very differently. As Dr. Liu mentioned, right? I mean, the organization is ultimately owned and driven by its members. So if she really starts to you know, drift far away from what the Americans and the Chinese want, she'll get in trouble. So I would imagine that you're not gonna see any big breakthroughs on policy. Professor Liu, a key priority for her, as she said, would be economic recovery from COVID-19. Now, until the end of last year, she chaired the Global Vaccine Alliance, Gavi, which aims to increase access to vaccines around the world. She now says the WTO has crucial work to do in this area. Looking ahead, do you think the WTO can play a bigger role in global pandemic response and vaccine distribu distribution? Uh, yeah, I think the the COVID-19 is probably the most pressing issue uh, for the organization and also for the world. If you look at how members or countries around the world have been doing 
since uh, the breakout of the COVID-19. Uh, you will see that that first they panic, they restrict export of uh, medical equipment, personal protection uh, materials, uh, uh, and afterwards they restrict also the export of food, which uh, is also problematic. And now, as you said, we have also an issue with the vaccine, how to manufacture, uh, manufacture them, how to distribute them, and also like Dr. Ngozi said in her statement that how to make sure that the vaccines are distributed in an equitable and affordable manner. Mm -hmm. On all these things, the WTO can uh, play a very central role. And Dr. Ngozi has already laid a clear map ahead on that with her back, uh, back, uh, past experience uh, on many aspects, such as to enhance the uh, transparency and monitoring mechanism of the WTO to see where are the restrictions, uh, how to lift them, mm -hmm. uh, and where the WTO can help re-establish the supply chain of uh, COVID-related materials. And uh, the last one is how to enhance manufacturing capacity all over the world so as to make sure that uh, people around the world, rich and poor, can have uh, a good access uh, for the vaccines, which will be the key to fight, uh, fight the COVID-19 in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, she has a good grasp of the issue, and I hope that members could work with her to really deliver that. Thank you. There is an ongoing debate about relaxing WTO rules on IP so that more drug manufacturers in uh, other parts of the world can produce the vaccines which are primarily being produced in a few uh, developed countries and plus in China. So in her speech, Dr. Onoko Iwela offered a third way in which we can license manufacturing to countries so that you can have adequate supplies while still making sure that IP issues are taken care of. Professor Kelly, how does that work and how likely will this proposal be welcomed by major drug manufacturers? Yeah, IP and IPR are really big issues, I think, for the WTO going forward, right? As the world becomes more of a service economy, more of a post-industrial economy, if you will, right? A sort of manufacturing and the direct sort of swap of good for good um, in trade. As that kind of fades and and countries swap information more, the rules have become much, much more complicated, right? About like what mm -hmm. exactly is owned by whom, right? You know, when should sort of patent protections, for example, start to fade? And these things are all really, really complicated. It's one of the reasons why the WTO actually hasn't closed a trade round in decades, I think. Um, and uh, I would imagine that this will continue to be a huge sticking point. The countries that have large and uh, pharmaceutical sectors, the United States, sort of fairly obviously, but you know, here in South Korea too, to be honest. Um, we'll probably fight the idea of loosening those restrictions for fairly obvious reasons. And here's where the issue of sort of COVID, though, I think might change things. Here's where there's sort of potential move. And that is that COVID is such an obvious global disaster. I think it's what more than 2 million people now have died from it, right? That there's going to be an enormous moral pressure on the pharmaceutical companies to come around and actually sort of loosen the rules, particularly for development for, for developing countries where, you know, um, uh, first world uh, uh, vaccines and, and medications are already astronomically expensive. And yeah. so I would imagine that you know, if she can sort of, you know, if she ha sticks to COVID, which as you mentioned, she's sort of really pushed, if she uses that and sort of the moral argument that, you know, this is a global pandemic and we really need to move on it, then I think she might make some, some, some headway. But, but in principle, I mean, the, the, the countries that are producing enormous amounts of IPR really want the WTO to heavily regulate it because they're, you know, they don't like piracy. They think they're losing billions and billions mm -hmm. a year on piracy. Yeah. Well, it's a very complicated issue, isn't it? Uh, and again, the WTO itself has been under a lot of uh, challenge, especially over the past few years. Former U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to withdraw, uh, withdraw the United States from the organization, saying that uh, it treats the U.S. unfairly and so on and so forth. Uh, luckily or fortunately, Biden, the uh, new U.S. president, has voiced strong support to the new DG, and China also put its weight and confidence in her. So, Professor Liu, with support of the biggest economies, do you think she will be able to help restore and rebrand the WTO, and particularly at a moment when China and the U.S. are not ready yet to resolve their differences in terms of trade? Uh, I think uh, few people, including the Americans, few people uh, agree with uh, uh, Trump uh, in labeling uh, the, the WTO in such a negative manner. 
uh, that's obvious from from our past experience. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there's a common view among members and also among the WTO observers that uh, WTO does need to, uh, to to be reformed in many aspects. Uh, and then uh, across is the uh, three pillars, which we say the deliberation, legislation, and the litigation. And that's what uh, Dr. Ngozi has uh, uh, make, uh, made a great efforts in detailing her priorities and her vision on how to reform the WTO in all these aspects. But also, as you say, that uh, the, this uh, uh, there's huge amount of issues uh, there that need to be resolved, and there's a huge divergence uh, among members, not only between China and US, uh, but also among many other members uh, on how the WTO can be reformed, where to start, how to do it. So I think I agree with uh, Dr. Kelly very much what he said just now that uh, this is going to be a long-term incremental process. We don't expect big breakthroughs, uh, big moves for the WTO in, in the future. But I do think that we are in a good position to move uh, incrementally, mm. progressively, to reform the WTO, update it towards the new reality. I think those are the uh, very good direction to go, at least. Mm. Well, the U.S. Uh, says uh, trade war on China has been one area particularly contentious uh, concerning the WTO. Last year, the WTO made a ruling that the U.S. tariffs were inconsistent with international trade rules. But, of course, the, um, uh, the previous uh, Trump administration went along with uh, tariffs uh, regardless. Dr. Okonio Iwela said we can be very helpful to both the U.S. and China to help bring them together to solve these problems uh, problems professor kelly do you expect more influence of the wto on this issue given its uh, uh, lack of enforcement mechanism at this moment but with a new leader to, to be honest i think the leadership of the wto matters less quite honestly than the change in leadership in the united states right which is to say that the biden administration doesn't share donald trump's sort of aggressive belligerent attitude towards international organizations, right? I mean, there's a real cleavage in the United States now between the Democratic Party, which is broadly comfortable with the world's multilateral structure, would maybe like to see it do a little bit more. For example, like you said, with COVID and, and, and the WTO, I think the Democratic Party would probably support that agenda. And the Republican Party, which has become quite unilateralist in the last 25 years and, and just doesn't really like the idea of the United States paying attention to these organizations and certainly doesn't like the perception that they give the United States orders or contradict the United States or whatever. And you saw this, of course, in the WTO context with the Trump administration's effort to undermine it, particularly destroy its, its, um, its adjudication process, right? Now, that the Biden people don't want to do that. I don't think that means the Biden people are going to sort of like jump in with both feet and stuff like that, right? The United States has an enormous amount of market power in the global economy, and you can use that to bully other states and other organizations and stuff like the WTO, for example. And the United States won't just sort of step back and allow global governance to displace that market power, but they'll behave a lot better. At the very minimum, I think that the, the, the Biden administration will support the reconstruction and the sort of the stability of the arbitration process, which to be quite honest, has actually been very helpful, right? I mean, if, if we want China and the United States not to sort of collide, right? One obvious thing to do is try to have a third party that can arbitrate the trade disputes that will arise. So, you know, nobody likes the WTO, but I'm not really quite sure what the alternative is. I mean, I, you know, we need something if it's not just gonna be tariff wars like the 20s you know, indefinitely. So, I mean, it's like the WTO or, or bust. I'm not really sure what the alternative is. <laughs> yeah, Professor Liu, what's your take on the prospect of the uh, dispute settlement mechanism, which had been, in, uh, you know, paralyzed for quite some time? What's the prospect under her, the new leader? Very briefly, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think that's also what Dr. Ngozi has taken as a top priority of her vision for the future of the WTO. Of course, this is... Uh, like the Dr. Kelly just said, that is a hugely divergent uh, issue, uh, not only between China and U.S., but also between U.S. and uh, uh, EU and others. So, but the WTO has laid on a good uh, basis before uh, Dr. Ngozi took her office. That is so-called Walker text, which lays out the concerns of various parties, including U.S. and others and which is a good basis to build upon. I think that's where okay. we should move ahead mm -hmm. in the near future. All Thank right. You.
Thank you so much, Professor Lucien Quinn, Emeritus Professor at the University of International Business and Economics, and Professor Robert Kelly from the Department of Political Science at Pusan National University in the Republic of Korea. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lucien. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lucien in Beijing. Download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.